Well, hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. Eventually, we really have had the gremlins this week. Yes, the show, I lost my internet connection today. We've had all sorts of problems with microphones at in the UK, but maybe it's to do with those storms and the weather and the high winds. I don't know. But it's good to see you all. Thank you for your patience sticking with us while we've been trying to sort this out. This is the perils of live YouTubing, I guess. But we are off to Germany. Operation Veritable that was underway, been, been underway for a, couple, uh, a few days by this point, 77 years ago. My guest, Dermot Rooney, is a defense analyst, and he is something of an obsessive about Operation Veritable, hence why he's come on to talk about this um, operation for this battle, which particularly features lots of street fighting. So he's had to move from the, his shared stroke office to into, the, into, the, into the main house, so maybe he'll be interrupted by his family coming back later, which that'll be lots of fun. But anyway, I think we're ready to go. So um, I'll bring Dermot in. So good evening, Dermot. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm all right, thanks, Paul. Apart from the fluster, you know, it was it was it was fun, wasn't it? So, um, but we're back here now. So, Operation Veritable. When we had our test check and chat, and we do have test chats, folks. Just that sometimes the tests work perfectly, and the live what doesn't. You know, we talked about your interest in Veritable, and the thing is, we've talked about it a lot on World War Two TV. It seems for a lot of people, once the Ardennes offensive is over and done with, people are just kind of waiting for VE Day to happen. And in fact, that February yeah. March period is really interesting. So, what is it about that period that you you find interesting? Why do you think we should be talking about it more? Well, well, I, I got into it for geek reasons, um, which which we won't go into. But um, uh, first. We came across about the veritable from the SSVC videos. I said there's three videos of that and the GOC training video. So I've seen all that going on for years. And I needed to pick, for my PhD thesis, I needed to pick an operation that was reasonably compact, quite interesting. And then I found out all the funky, lovely stuff from there on. And you're going to share that with us tonight. So we won't be faffing around till we've people been waiting long enough. So I'll fire up the PowerPoint. So it was going to be Dermot controlling it, but he's on his phone now, not his computer. So I'm controlling it. So uh, we'll go back to that. So um, relearning the lessons of urban combat. So basically, I'm going to hand over to you, Dermot. And when you want me to move on to the next slide, just say next. And folks, we'll probably do questions at the end today. I think, to be honest, I've seen the PowerPoint. It's very well prepared. There's lots of information. I think you'll be following everything as we go along. But Far away with your comments, but questions will do it at the end. So, Dermot, over to you. Uh, cracking. So, okay, so um, urban combat's back in fashion. Um, after 20 odd years of peace enforcement operations and counterinsurgency, we're now looking at, uh, at near peer enemy. So, armies are going, oh, fighting in cities, that's important. Everybody lives in cities, etc. And we're looking back to the past to learn lessons from that. Um, often, though, the lessons aren't particularly well learned. Gok has got a place in the heart of British Army doctrine. Uh, it's one of um, a series of three videos about all uh, urban combat. Uh, there's uh, the Gok one, which is the final one. There's one on Ortona, which you've already covered. Yeah. Uh, and one before that, that's one of the channel ports, but I forget which. Um, and, and this is the kind of stuff that still gets rattled out, still gets shown in training. Um, this, uh, this show there, there's a postcard from Gok. Uh, the scribbly writing, top right, says, um, Our house where we were buried for eight hours. So you could buy a postcard of your town that was in rubble and send it to your friends saying, uh, this was a horrible bit of war and we were there. Wow. Um, Gok was bombed on the night of the 7th of February. The eight hour for Veritable was uh, 10.30 on the 8th. So A, bombing Gok um, let uh, Schlem, who was the head of the German first parachute army, which was which was the defending force, know that we were coming. Um, uh, the bombing was quite intense. It should have had 456 bombers on it. Luckily, I left my crib sheet with all the numbers on in my shed. Oh. <laughs> but after the first 155 bombers had dropped their load on bombs uh, on Gok. The, the, the smoke plume was so big they couldn't see the town, so they just pulled out and didn't drop the rest. If they dropped them all, uh, just an indicator of the intensity, it doesn't really quite play out like this, but um, if you take the population of Dresden, they had roughly one bomber per 300 head of population. Gok had one bomber per 30 head of population. So wow. Gok's attacked about 13,000 people. So it, it would have been extremely intense, and it's lucky for all concerned maybe that those... Uh, extra bombers went elsewhere. Um, 
So like I say, this is a thesis chapter. So I'm following Gok all the way through, but it's a thesis. So you have to do themes. And so each chapter is a different theme. So at the first, it's artillery suppression. And then there's stuff on tactical logistics and so on. And then Gok is the obvious urban one. Um, and I do... I do history to, to learn lessons. Um, you know, I, I play with numbers and, and we do stuff. Uh, historical analysis has been going on in defence research for years, but we have to kind of cross over into the real world to deal with people um, in order to get uh, that to work. Now, I think with the GOC chapter, I think I'm 90% there, but I thought that about three months ago as well, and I wasn't. Um, the big gaps are the German side. So I'm going to get to the end of the thesis and then go back and fill in the German side because that's obviously the, the records are pretty poor and my German's really poor. Um, and, and on that to, subject, Dermot, just to interrupt you, that you never know, you might meet, meet someone through this show who can fill in some gaps for you. So at the end of it, you know, we'll, we'll let people know how they can get in touch with you because it is a collaborative um, uh, process, this yeah. whole understanding of battle like this. There's people on the ground there, people who have access to different archives. So if you can, if you can help Dermot fill in his 10%, he'd be a very happy bunny. Or if you can tell me that I'm only got 20%, that's even better. Um, so, uh, they, I mean, I've, I've, got to, I've got to do a big thank you already to, to amateur historians um, and professional historians that have been a great help, but they get paid. It's the people who do it for, you know, with, with academic rigour, with, with tenacity, um, because they love the subject. They love the Fifth Loamshires or they love this particular vehicle type or they, you know, they're following their granddad and they find this stuff out for me. And send it my way, and it's beautiful. And so, one big thank you goes out to my mate Stolpe. Um, on if you go on World War II talk, look him up. He knows the ground of Veritable really well, and he's lent me loads of stuff, and he's a great guy. Um, so, and also getting me apologies in first. This is a bit of a picture raid from the internet. So, here's uh, uh, one of the few aerial photographs that I was able to get hold of. And apologies for my colours because I've got colour defective vision, so my maps are rather garish, and my pronunciation. Um, I'm, I'm from Derbyshire, so English is my second language. Dutch, German, French, they've got no chance of being pronounced properly, but I'll give it a go. Right. Next one. Okay, so uh, like Paul was already saying, I, I learnt about the war in Northwest Europe by old soldiers telling me stories on that, when I was sat on their knee, but also by watching the, vid, the, the films that were on telly all the time. So it's got a beginning, a middle and end in Northwest Europe. It's the longest day, it's a bridge too far, and it's um, uh, Battle of the Bulge. Um, the Bridget Ray Morgan being the alternative second ending that nobody really likes, so we, we don't, don't care anymore. Um, but Veritable came after that. Uh, so it was almost immediately, with a give or take three or four weeks, depending on where you cut the end of, of the Ardennes campaign, and it was to push the Germans out from the gap between the Mars or Meurs and the Rhine. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Veritable, it's February, March 1945. If you count both sides, there are over 400,000 troops involved, about 90,000 Germans, about 320,000 allies. Um, the 30 Corps plan, which was curiously different to the 1st Canadian Army plan, yet very similar to the 21st Army Group plan, um, had 30 Corps dashing down between the two rivers in order to seize the Vaisal bridges. From there, we'd capture the Ruhr, and then the war would be over by Easter. But it took 30 days and not three. It's very well documented about how, oh, there was the thaw and, oh, dear, we can't do this because of the mud. We can't do it because of the mines. But that's all overplayed because, um, as, as, as a couple of canny observers have already pointed out, that it, February in Germany in 94, uh, February in Germany, in the north, <laughs> it's going to be boggy, especially if you're on a floodplain, which most of this action was. Um, so um, Horrocks, who's in the middle of the usual suspects there, uh, just peeping over Montgomery's shoulder. Um, he said there was no room for manoeuvre and no scope for cleverness. Not entirely true. He did do some really funky, clever things, but they never quite came off due to various reasons we, we'll, we'll get into maybe a bit later. Uh, and he called it a slog in which only two things mattered, training and guts. The training and guts did matter, but they were very much constrained by higher level uh, impact. Not that it's anybody's fault, but it was it was a systemic problem. Um Next slide, please. OK, so uh, if you're looking at it on a phone like me, this has perhaps taught me a lesson for making such twiddly slides. This is the standard thing. It's, this is from the BAOR Battlefield Tour map. Um, number one on the left is Husbeck Heights. I will pronounce that wrong. Or Grosbeek, which it was, where 82nd Airborne landed during the market got. Um, 
they defended that bit and the front line on the on on the on our map really didn't change between september and the 8th of february the idea was uh, to destroy 84th uh, infantry division which was the main defensive force uh, over there on the left by the number one i'm sorry i'll have to stop poking at the screen because my finger must get really big sorry um almost nothing to do with the reichswald that's the number four it was a tertiary objective it came after the main effort which is the number two there to get over the gap between the Reichswald and the floodplain and break out from there and dash to get the bridges at Wesel, which is the number three over at the far right. So it's about 60k from the start line to Wesel. Anyway, various reasons we won't go into, including a, a counterattack by 47 Panzer Corps, really screwed that up. And so everything stalled around uh, Claver, Cleve, where Anna Cleve's come from, around one feature. One feature. Um, and then there was a, a long slog. And so under pressure from the Canadian army, but also because everybody was pretty tired, after about 10 days of doing that, the 2nd Canadian Corps, whoops, yes, 2nd Canadian Corps was activated on the left. And that meant that the main effort for, for 30 Corps became Gok. They had to get round Gok or get through it and get off down south or hook round to get to those bridges. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, here's Gok in a bit more detail. The key features of the ground here are the big blue line wriggling through the middle. Uh, that's the River Nears, um, uh, an insubstantial obstacle. If you were Moltke, uh, a cavalry division could get across it in, in, in 20 minutes, perhaps. Um, but if you've got lots of tanks that dig holes with their tracks, it's really desperate. You need good bridges. You need dry ground around those bridges. And uh, it, that makes it a lot of work. And that made it a battle of two hearts. Um, the defenders in there, and, and that list is in order of sexiness, and it's missing a few people. There was uh, 2nd uh, Falschenregger Division, 7th Falschenregger Division, uh, bits of uh, 15 Panzer Grenadier Division, uh, bits of 655 Heavy Tank Destroyers uh, Battalion, uh, 180, uh, 180, 190, 84 Division, and 1 to 5 uh, Volksturm uh, companies. So there's just fragments of all those in. The entire defence never got above 2,000 men. But there's little bits from everywhere, and they're all under command of uh, Second Falsy Mega Corps under Mendel. Um, around that, off the map a little to the, to the bottom left is 52nd um, Lowland Division, uh, top 51st, 51st Highland Division, who've been fighting along the bottom edge of the Reichswald for 10 days before they get to Gok. Um, just above them, 53rd Welsh Division, famously fighting in the Reichswald. Um, one of their battalions gets engaged in this. Um, north, the 15 Scottish are on this map. They're actually up, by, up around Claver, uh, assembling, ready to do this attack. Uh, and on the right there is 43rd Wessex Division. Now, what's allowed, what's allowed this is that they've suddenly got through this stalemate, done a brig breakthrough, uh, and they've, they've advanced 4K, which is a lot compared to what the, the previous advances, uh, and captured about prisoners. prisoners. And they've got to this ridge, you can see, on the right there above the town, um, which, is, which is only like 20, 30 metres higher than the other ground behind it. But it's a dominating feature because the rest of the ground is so flat. And at the base of that is dug a genuine anti-tank ditch. Most of the other anti-tank ditches you can see uh, are actually little rivers, managed rivers to you know, drain off water, farmland, farmland, farmland running fine. Um, you'll see above the long anti-tank ditch, there are, is a, 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 a note saying bunkers. Uh, and that's where most of the bunkers were. So when people talk about the, the, the bunkers in Goth, most of them weren't in Goth. I think there was one command bunker in the town itself. Um, now, the main effort is going to be um, in the, the south of the town or the, the, the right-hand side, the left-hand side of the river, as you look at it, is uh, 153 Brigade from 51st Highland Division. And they're going to attack the southern half of the town. And on the uh, right hand side is 44 Brigade, and they're going to, to the Scottish Division, Scottish Division, and they're going to attack the northern half of the town. And I think that's it. Next slide, please. Okay, so a, a quick burst on Gox historiography. It, it's, it's all like the usual stuff. This is, this, if it's written down, it's a bit of a memorial, it's a bit inspirational, it's a bit of one general blame and another general. A little bit of, you know, like congratulations, back we've done the back we've done the war, didn't we do well? And, and who can blame anybody? But an awful lot of forgetting, a strange organisational forgetting too, because um, one of the later slides, you'll see that 
uh, about one in five of battalion commanders were on leave. Um, and then you're getting guys who are sick, you're getting guys who are promoted away. So anybody who's keeping a decent memoir, um, a, a terrible large number of them just take weeks off in the middle of veritable, don't about it, about it, or just cuff it. And there's there, there's a lot of that. And also people who, people who are on record, a record, they're a bit bored describing a, describing a company over and over and over and over. So the battalion gets to veritable. There's a lot of forgetting going on. Forgetting going on. Um, uh, my key, key, my key foil in this, and it's, it's and fair on the people involved. Just, just stop for a second there, though. You're, you, for some reason, your, your audio is echoing now. Let's. Uh, oh. I'll, try, I'll try. I'll try. Try again now. How's that? Yeah, keep keep going. It, it was it, you were kind of it was like repeating itself. Try again. Um. Uh. Oh, 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 okay. Okay. So the the there was a piece of piece of, yeah. Good. Okay, so piece of historical analysis conducted in the 1980s. Um, uh, in the UK, we, we became very big on historical analysis, learning lessons from previous combat, uh, about fighting in woods, fighting in cities, uh, anti-tank defence, etc., etc. And this was one of the first studies that did this. And it was an informal study. It was secondary and it was recollection. It, was, it, it didn't use all the sources. It, it used very few sources to get to its conclusions. Um, and uh, it, it said, you know, the, but then it got turned into the 90s training video. So somebody had to make a tra training video. This was a piece of paper that they found. Brilliant. Let's do this. This is the best bit we've got. And they built it around that. Um, now, you can see that video on YouTube. Just do urban warfare gop and it'll pop up. Um, and that video is, well, a few years ago, it was still used in training. Now, I can't be sure that it was. But last time I went to Copel Down, uh, people were watching this video. Um not while they were running around shooting at things, but the, the video. So it's also subject to a bit of war porn. And now I'm going to have to squint to get into my camera now. So it said um, R.W. Thompson, who wrote uh, Men Under Fire, not Men Against Fire, Men Under Fire. He also wrote uh, the Rhineland book, uh, one, of the, one of the two Rhineland books, maybe three. Um, and he said, all the approaches to the town were covered by dikes, anti-tank ditches, trench systems and pillboxes. And the whole area, as the final attack opened, was like the crater of a volcano in eruption. It seemed impossible that a single square foot of air could be free from screaming metal. Now, that's written by a journalist, but it's written by a journalist who was there within a couple of days of the battle starting. So he did bump into some of the Black Watch that we're talking about now, and he had a chat with them. So that's where he got from. Next slide, please. Um, so this is that report, and, and uh, a lovely kind I believe his name is Bobby Hanscom. Uh, I've tried to track him down through the internet, and I've asked a few soldiers who might know these things, but I haven't been able to find him. But you see, that is, this is an informal report. It should not be quoted in other work. But then somebody's turned it into a training video, which is, you know, <laughs> you can't blame video makers, and you can't blame people who write reports. But there you go. Uh, next slide, please. So it's like a, it's, it, it's so very much a battle of two halves. Um, the, the map at the top there, 44 brigades attack. Um, that's taken from the BOR Battlefield Tour, the British Army in the Rhine Battlefield Tour, written in 1947. It was written in 1947 when uh, Horrocks was either, I'm stretching my mind now, he was either commander of the BOR or he was lined up to be CGS. Maybe Montgomery was CGS at the time. But anyway, uh, you're not going to say bad things about your boss's boss's boss. Um, if you look through the list of, uh, and you can buy this now, it's, it's back in reprint, um, uh, and the director's edition, the director's staff edition, is is, is available to buy. Um, lovely, bit, lovely resource, but 20% uh, um, fiction, unfortunately. Wow. And, um, so there's the, the lovely plush version, 44 Brigades, easily accessible, all well written up and all signed off, and the not really well followed up 153 uh, Brigade version, which was even... Um, condensed in the uh, 51st Highland Division's own history doesn't doesn't do it full justice. Um, so the lessons drawn from that in the 1980s is that the armoured infantry by 44 Brigade worked really well, went really quick. They did combined arms, really cool, really quick. They attacked on multiple axes that fit with 1980s doctrine. That was great. They used tight control. The definition of that's a little bit dubious. Um, which was really fit with 1980s doctrine, which was, you know, the, the following on from uh, Montgomery's master plan view. Um, and they suffered few casualties and they cleared the entire northern half of the town in a day. Brilliant. Um, whereas 153 Brigade in the south, they were seen as, well, they attacked, dismounted, so they were slow. 
uh, they didn't have enough armor. They, their ability to coordinate with their armor was much reduced because it was the south end of Gok that got the most hammer from the RAF. Um, and they attacked on one axis, which was bad. They echeloned through. So one battalion attacks, one battalion attacks, next battalion attacks, next battalion attacks. Um, and though that was old hat and that was bad. And there, there, there are obvious problems with doing that. Um, and it was claimed that they, they had poor control uh, and they suffered high casualties and it took twice as long to clear the southern half of town. So the conclusions from that, which have been passed on in, in army doctrine and training, um, are that uh, we ought to fight like 44 Brigade. And urban fighting is very attritional. Those two things aren't necessarily true. Next slide, please. Um, so here's two halves. So under 30 Corps, the two divisions that we're going to focus on a little bit, 51st Highland Division, 15th Scottish Division. Underneath them, you've got 153 Brigade and 44 Brigade. Ignore the other brigades. And underneath them, you'll see there's nine battalions that all fought in Gok. Another four, five were engaged outside of Gok and had some material impact on the outcome of the battle. So if I was to talk about all of them, you'd get confused. Um, and that was part of the 1980s thing as well. So that combined the 44 Brigade history and the uh, BAOR Battlefield Tour with the Juan Gordon's account, which uh, I, I had a book here to show you. Uh, so Few Got Through by Martin Lindsay. Lovely book. Uh, you can get it re reasonably cheap. It's a reprint now. You can get it for about five, I think. Um, whereas the Fifth Black Watchers history, which I'm going to focus on, uh, The Spirit of Angus, uh, that... Uh, is about 60 quid and very difficult to get hold. So I'm going to talk more about that because the people don't get that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, th the tactical stuff that I do isn't very popular with military historians these days. Um, and they'll often quote uh, Wellington State stating that the, the history of a battle is like the history of a ball. You know, nobody can be sure of when all these things happened. Everybody's got their own little view. So you never be able to write a history. And I've had that quoted back at me saying, well, what's the point writing write the history of a battle? Because it's like the history of a ball. But the thing is, uh, through the war diaries and the communication logs that were kept at the time, we can essentially talk to all the guests or, you know, a, lot, a large number of the guests. And these are guests that, unlike in, in, in Wellington's time, they had watches, they had maps, they had logbooks. They wrote this stuff down. They scribbled on things and they kept a record at the time. So what you're going to see today is, is a condensed version of a condensed version of 38 war diaries and logs, 29 histories and memoirs, 23 miscellaneous reports, and me not walking around the battlefield anywhere near enough. Um, but that's me patting myself on the back for being a really clever boy who's tried really hard. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, let's get on to the real world. This is this is Plan F. Uh, you've got two pictures there. Uh, the, the one at the top is 10 HLI on one of uh, two Scots Guards Churchills. I'm going to be talking about eight Royal Scots riding on four Grenadier Guards Churchills. Now, I always have I always have to pause with the guards, and I always have to call, pause with the multiple versions of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers as well. But So sorry if I got the wrong one there. So... This is 18, the 18th of February. It's D plus 10. This is, is probably plan F. It could even be plan M. There was a plan to go through Gok that uh, 43 Division through Gok, through Gok on D plus 1, like shit through a goose, fly off down the right, down the south, and just head south until they bumped into Americans. And meanwhile, Guards Armour Division would go herring off cross country and capture the Vasel Bridges. Um, but we're on plan F now. We're on 10 days in. Eight Royal Scots that we're going to look at, uh, they've been, been given nine different plans in seven days. So on the bus, off the bus, go over here, go over there. You're going to be doing a counterattack here, or you're going to block here, or you're now under this division, or you're going to be here, or you're going to do that, you're going to do the other. So all that on the, bus, on the bus, off the bus, but not doing anything. And it was the same for the entire brigade and pretty much for the entire people being People being dicked around. So 44 Brigade wrote their own plan for Operation Spider. And they called it Operation Spider because their, because their brigade commander was, uh, I can't remember, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's gone, uh, coming Bruce. There was his son, Bruce, Bruce, and the spider was the thing that made him say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. So they're telling the boss he's a great guy. And at the same time, 
expressing their frustration at not being able to break out until this point. Um, but if we uh, if we go back, don't go back to the wiring diagram. But you get the standard wiring diagram. Wiring diagram. Core makes report, gives orders. Divisions give orders. Brigades give orders. Battalions give orders. Da, 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 and away you go. Didn't work like that. Uh, on the afternoon of the seventeenth, there was a planning group meeting by thirty where, where Horrocks said, "Okay, forty-three division. If you can get onto that high ground above Gok, but no further." 15 Division will either bypass or go through you and attack Gok. But 43 Division, if you can't, if you, if you can get further, if you can capture it, crack on. Or if you can bypass it, crack on. Because we're, we're on about tempo now. We really want to get moving. Meanwhile, what's happened is that uh, 44 Brigade have written Op Spider and they've given it to their Divisional Commander. And the Divisional Commander goes to um, <laughs> goes to uh, 43 brigades the 43 divisions to commander and says look I've got a good deal um, and they did a bargain which was I tell you what 43 divisions said well, well we'll get the crossings and you capture God and they went brilliant off we go so they were glad to offload what they expected to be a rather horrible fighting um, the 15 divisions plans were they had three different plans and they all involved 44 brigade in their armored in their armored comfort zone um just isolating Gok and shooting off to the south possibly uh, and east possibly while 227 brigade who were much better at doing armored clearances dismounted were going to go in and attack dismounted however 227 brigade largely got poached by one of the Canadian divisions, and so they couldn't do it. So 44 Brigade had to do it. So that's why they attacked in armour. It wasn't it wasn't a, a well thought out plan. It was just a bit of a rush. Um, 44 Brigade had this scheme, this Blerick job, which became the template for armoured infantry assault uh, after the war as well. This this Blerick job they used it in Operation um, Guildford, I think, was the capture of Blerick. Uh, 3rd of December, and I forget what the large operation was for that, um, but it was going to be a dash. And they, they'd done two plans, a low, medium and high resistance plan. So if the Germans have melted away, we're just going to fart through town and go out the bottom. I'll show you that bit next. Um, but uh, if there's medium resistance, we're going to capture all the northern towns, we, all the north of the town. We've got all these objectives. And then we're going to send through our reserve ba battle group, our reserve battalion group, and they're going to do the crossings and, uh, and out the other side. Uh, and then if it's high resistance, if it goes on past nightfall, get these little secure company level strong points in town. Problem was tactical logistics. Even with the best case with that plan, uh, 43 Division was going to get the crossings in at 0600 in the morning on the 18th. But the attack wasn't going to be able to go in until 1500 because it was going to take so long to get all these bits of armour together from all different parts of 30 Corps, glue them all together, put them in coherent order in assembly area and send them across the start line. Next slide, please. Um, right, now, uh, apologies to anybody with mobile phones who, like me, can't really see all these little squiggly writing. So why don't we fart through this next few slides, Paul? Um, what you've got is the fire plan going in all different sides. So from two hours before the assault goes in, there's a bit of fire to the north, bit of fire to the east, bit of fire to the west. Keep on going until the yellow lines get solid. Ah, I think you're using an earlier version. No, you're not. You're not. Carry on. Carry on. Sorry. Keep going. There we go. Oh, yeah. Then the lines have got solid. So I, I drew big circles around them, but they seem to have disappeared or I forgot to put them in or I sent you the wrong version or whatever. It's the one um, you're using today. Oh, and there's the, there's the two battalion axes there ready to go into town. Um. Uh, and what's happening now is this is uh, H minus 15 to H plus 5. The front edge of the fire plan goes in together with the pepper pot. So this is getting on for 500 guns are going to be firing. Uh, within that, added on top of that, is the pepper pot. So uh, you've, you've, you've already covered this with veritable medium machine gun, generally uh, spraying bullets in the general direction of Germany, actually going for specific objectives. 40mm uh, Bofors, 17-pound uh, anti-tank guns, 
etc., uh, building up uh, until the 4.2 inch mortar. Wow. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, then uh, the fire plan moves. Now, these were all uh, off call fire missions. So they were, they were all set up. So you get an on call fire mission, you plot where it's going to be. This is mission one, two, three, four, and you just call that. You're ready. Don't, we won't fire it. We won't fire. We won't fire until forward observation officer, forward observation officer says, shoot one, two, three, four now, and it gets fired. Well, these are off call. The idea was that these would fire constantly until the companies in their kangaroos, with their tank support, with their bridging, with their flails, got close to that objective, and then you would call off the fire, the fire would lift, and you would assault that objective. Or you would just drive through it. Um, next slide, please. And they continue at the bottom of town. Next slide, please. And both of the lead battalion groups would just fly out the bottom of the town and exploit straight through. They'd do break in, break through, break out, and exploit all in a one. And that's the joy of armoured stuff. That was the dream of, of armoured combined arms assault on the town. Um, next slide, please. Um, Unfortunately, the first problem with that was that it almost entirely got cancelled, though that fire from two hours before uh, got whittled down to just 15 minutes before because uh, Veritable's opening fire plan fired something around 700,000 rounds. It's now 10 days in. The, the 30 Corps has fired about 3 million artillery rounds by now. And we're starting to exceed the factory capacity back in the UK and the US, let alone the shipping, let alone getting it down those little roads, because there's wow. an awful lot of rounds being fired. And the next one is this, this coup de main idea. Some sources call it a reconnaissance in force, some call it a coup de main. And what happened was uh, a brigadier coming, Bruce, with his, with his um, brigade tack, went down to, you see the number one there? Uh, I can just see it. I should have written this bigger. <laughs> you get down to about the number one. So is it between this this, this hamlet, um, uh, a manor house farm of Rosenhof and the bridge crossing? And he gets to he gets about halfway there, about 300 metres away from the bridge. Nobody shoots at him. It's half past nine in the morning. The only Germans he's seen are ones captured by 43 Division. They look a little bit sick, lame and lazy. And it said, uh, and uh, one of the histories has, uh, it looks very much as if the enemy garrison seeing the trap closing around the north and south, had decided to call it a day before worse things befell them. So, you know, good, sensible decision, not, not criticising the decision by, by the brigadier there at all, but it looks like the Germans have gone, let's go now. Let's pull together a company group, stick, them in some, stick the company in some kangaroos, get a couple of tank troops together, uh, get some bridge in, get some flails, get a couple of crocodiles if we've got them, send them in. Um, and we'll dash that. We might be able to bounce the town, bounce the bridge, get out the other side. Um, unfortunately, they're still contained by 1940s radios, still contained by tactical logistics. Um, the axis he's on is six KOSB's axis, the sixth battalion of the King's Own Scottish Border. Sorry, I'm acronym heavy. Um, uh, but they're stuck in a traffic jam north of the assembly area. The only guys that are available, I think it's a company of uh, eight Royal Scots. Stick them in some kangaroos, bring them down. Uh, but they're still not ready to go until 1330. Uh, so we've got quite a big flash to bang time just because of the difficulties arranging these things in those days. Um, and one of the problems is this uh, AVRE, Armoured Vehicle Recon Royal Engineers, with an SBG bridge on it, a small box girder bridge. The top left vehicle, uh, the top right vehicle, sorry, you can see there, that is a small box girder bridges. It, it, it's a small box girder bridge. It is made out of small box girders. It's a pretty big bridge. It's 10 metres high. It sticks up the top of the vehicle, and that's how the vehicle drives around. Um, apparently, in Europe, tree-lined roads are very important, uh, and uh, so it constantly snags. This was a problem on D-Day for Veritable, um, and it was a problem now. And that slowed it down a little bit, but mainly the problem was that when the tank, when the Avery got to the crossing site, dropped the bridge, and by most accounts, some of them give a different version, by most accounts, the um, uh, ooh, the, the disconnect, the unhook mechanism, the thing you press to be able to drive away and leave the bridge behind, that was broken. So the tank that's carried the bridge can't get over the bridge. No other tanks can get over the bridge. Um, the infantry at this point 
some of them uh, depouch. That's what you do with kangaroos. You don't debush. You don't disembark. You don't get out. You depouch. They depouch and cross the bridge. They clear some houses at the far side of the thing. I, no, may, no, I speak wrong. They get into some trenches at the far side of the uh, anti-tank ditch, at which point the defenders decide this is a good time to spring our little trap. If the Amber decided to spring a little trap, maybe it's just that's the only time they noticed. But they start getting engaged by small arms and Panzerfaust from buildings on both sides of the crossing. Uh, there's some long-range machine guns that starts coming in from town. Uh, a 75 mil gun starts firing straight down the road on fixed lines. Uh, one of the Churchills, as soon as the anti-tank gun starts firing, the usual 88 driver reverse, um, reverses up one of the kangaroos. Uh, the kangaroo driver does a neutral turn, backs out. The Churchill falls on its side and most of the armour bomb bursts at this point. Um, the, uh, the couple of average that are still there, they engage the houses with their uh, petard mortars, you know, the, the dustbin, everybody calls it. Uh, and the infantry clear the houses on this side of the crossing. But that A company, if, if indeed it is A company, seeing as I've lost my clip sheet, whoopsie, um, they are, um, they're split either side of the crossing. Then they may get some artillery fratricide. I'm not too sure whether they did because none of the fire missions seem to be on, none of the code of fire missions seem to be on this point. One of the big problems is uh, that there's a mattress fire mission that they can't switch off. They managed to switch off all the ones after this, but there's one going smack into the middle of town um, at about this time. There's a wonderful bit of failed speech such as, that starts along the lines of, um, regarding the things that you sleep on, our communications with the chaps who run this cannot be can, are, are not working. It won't be switched off. Tell your guys to keep their heads down. Um, I'm paraphrasing at the end there, obviously. Um, so the mattress fire means okay. So that's it. We go back to Plan F. Go back to what, go back to what we what we what we were we're going to assault. Going to assault at, at, at fifteen hundred. Next slide, please. Uh, that's a mattress rocket. Oh God, yes. I've sent you an old version. Sorry about this. Um, and what a battery of mattress rockets would do? They would take out about a quarter of a grid square. It'd have a sheath sheath of about four. Is, is, a great big circular area that would just get that would just get, oh, rectangle which would just get mashed up. Anybody above ground would be having a serious problem. Not very good against armor, not very good against people dug in, but anybody out and about would be really in trouble. So that was part of the reason they were really worried about it. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the photo is interesting because that's the ground. So that's taken. If you, if you look at the map at the bottom. There's a little uh, icon of a camera there, and that's where that shot was taken from. And so it's, it's, it's completely flat, very open, very easy to engage people, and the ground around it is. So, so your ability to manoeuvre off that in, a, in an armoured vehicle is really quite limited. They've had that, that the artillery, not the, artil the artillery fire plan, the reduced artillery fire plan, they stopped that in order to launch uh, this Kuna main attempt. Now they've got to start it again. The coordination confusion is really difficult. By my reckoning, there's about 20 people between the company commander on the ground and the man who pressed the button that would launch, if indeed it has a button, that would launch those mattress rockets. So getting all that organised is difficult. Difficult. OK. So on the southern axis there, KOSB have to go in, but their killing area has already been activated. Awful lot of fuss. That bridge in operation is still going in. Another average called in. I believe that one bogs. They have to back it up, use the scenes, use diggers and do all that work under fire. Um, they do it, but it's 2300 by the time it gets going, by the time the bridge is ready to cross. And so those guys go, they dash in, they dash in the first company. I'm not sure whether they went in with tank support. They aren't, don't seem to be mentioned. I think they went without tanks. Um, they got about 300 metres and bumped a uh, hit a Panzerfaust ambush. Everybody depouches, clears the houses near them, and then are engaged in an exchange of fire overnight. And they're essentially pinned down about 300 metres past the bridge. Um, the next two companies then uh, attack dismounted. And the fourth company uh, stays back in reserve, I think. Um, uh, 
by 0600, they're only on two of the four fallback objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, almost all of that isn't mentioned in the uh, the video stuff. It's all says, you know, and we achieved all our objectives. Well done. Not we didn't achieve most of our fallback objectives. So on to A-Royal Scots, who are kind of, kind of uh, my focus for this. Um, they have a very similar problem. They have got armoured support. They've got tanks leading. They go down this track. They don't even have a road. The other guys are going, uh, the, the King's Own Scottish Borders are going down a road. Eight Royal Scots are going down what's essentially a farm track. They get to a bridge that's suitable for supporting farm vehicles. Churchill goes over it. Bridge collapses. Churchill falls in. Um, I think that's one of the instances that gets seen by a lot of people coming later. So that when, they, when you hear people say, oh, it was so boggy in the rice bowl that Sherman tanks were sinking up their turret rings, it was because of two or three examples of Churchill's trying to cross canals without the aid of a bridge. That's why they sank um, up to their turret rings. Um, the, so it collapses, it gets all boggy around there. And again, they have to get bulldozers in for scenes and build up that crossing. It's 2300 again before that crossing is ready to go in. And once again, they launch a company. This time, they definitely have tanks with them and they dash across. They get 300 metres and they hit a railway line. Um, now, th there's a little bit of, of, of low-key bitching at this point. Uh, 49 APC Regiment, according to the infantry, then turn around and do the 1940s version of a, a London cabbie. Uh, I'm not going south this time of night, this time of night mate. And say, we can't cross this railway. It'll strip our tracks you guys have to get out. Now, I'm sure it was, it, there were valid, valid reasons. Nobody wanted to go on, on a railway crossing in an urban area at night in an open-topped uh, armoured vehicle. Um, you only have to look forward in time to the Battle of Grosny to see how that might have been a bad idea. And they dump them there, and then they head back. On the way back, you've got a, a company's worth of kangaroos, a troop of tanks bumps into twice as much that's, much that's still trying to cross the bridge. They can't get anywhere. Listen, listen. Uh, the CO of Eight Royal Scots turns around and says, OK, guys, sack it. Let's go in dismounted. And so the next two companies go in dismounted. Um, they have a real bugger. One, one of the companies um, bypasses a German platoon. Uh, and as they're kind of strung out, they're, they're doing the company snake walk track to get, to get into go, to get into go. Um, this German platoon you know, sits there, waits, attempts to break out, just cuts through the middle of the company snake, kills the company, signaler, signaler damages the, the number 18 set, um, and so they can't, they, that company can't communicate for that reason. Uh, and off they go, and, and they, they break out, they cause some more mayhem around a bit later on. Um, so the next company comes across, so the, that first company dismounted, crossed the railway, occupied a factory. One of the other companies comes and joins them. The third company stays on this side of the river, uh, this side of the railway line in some houses. The fourth company, the one that we started with, I think it was A Company, um, they then get the go-ahead because KOSB have come through. They get the go-ahead to, to leave their crossing in area and join the rest of the battalion. Uh, on the way, they get bumped by some Germans who um, uh, challenge them in English and then shoot at them in German. And uh, it's all pretty horrible. But eventually, they join up with the other company. And uh, so um, uh, eight Royal Scots by zero six only got, only got a toehold in one of their four fallback objectives. So of the of the eight objectives, only three of them have been tenuously grabbed hold of. All, that all kind of gets lost in the noise. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we we, we go south now to one five three brigade. Here's a messy slide. Uh, they had a plan A, which is yellow, and a plan B, which is red, but the key point of this is drive, drive from all the way on the left-hand side of the map, 12, maybe 15K as a road move. They've only got 20 trucks to start to move, in, to move an entire brigade. They get a few trucks later, but they've got to go on what's essentially the main supply route for the entire core. And so finding time to get folks down that. So then they walk the last and do all that and do all that kind of stuff. And that's why go in, go in in echelon. And that's why there's big gaps between one battalion and and the next battalion attacking is because it takes so long to get them all from one end of the thing. And it was a, it was a really cunning and brilliant plan, um, but it, by, the, by the logistic constraints. 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so 153 Brigade go in. Um, so, first off, note the, the ground on the, in the north. If you can see, if you can see it like I can't, uh, then you'll see that there's two of them's care, one of them's care OSB in the north. The yellow line is essentially the, the British front line. Uh, you've got two bobbles there, one with six care OSB in it and one with eight Royal Scots in it. They've surrounded quite a lot of Germans. Three, four, five hundred Germans have been, have been encircled, effectively, by that. Um, that really kicks in when Fire Black Watch comes. Uh, first, they go to a crossing that uh, the two have made, uh, which only got some indirect fire on it, and they follow a, a very intense fire plan. Um, so from uh, midnight, I think they launch about one, half past, half past two, achieved or achieved all their objectives. Um, they've captured Germans in, the Germans in the way, shot quite a lot up, and most, by the battalion's account, um, they find Germans cowering, still dazed by the fire plan as they go in. Um, unfortunately, on one of the accounts says, uh, and, and, and one of the radio uh, radio logs or one of the um, uh, one of the war diaries says that the, the German defence metaphorically woke up after that. So people have retrospectively read that and assumed that they caught everybody asleep. So there's this, this story perpetuated a little bit by Lindsay's uh, So Few Got Through, that the entire defence was all asleep, um, that they captured the um, uh, they captured the uh, garrison commander Matasek uh, while he was asleep or while he was at breakfast. Uh, they actually captured him wounded in a hospital with his staff. I think the headquarters was in the grounds of the hospital or in this hospital cellar. Um, so uh, he, 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 he wasn't asleep. Nobody was asleep. Oh, well, maybe somebody, but, but they were mainly hiding from the terrible fire plan. Now, their assault has got some accidental advantages. So the original plan by 51st Island Division was to come down from the northeast, more, more along the road you can see, you, know, you can't quite see, off to the left. And uh, five Seaforths have got there. And they become an artillery target. They stay in bunkers. If you ever get a book, Battalion, Alistair Bookwick, I think. Um, lovely book. They are in the cellar watching the town, the town or village of Aspen and being smashed around them and pouring all the pouring all the German fire. They're all thinking that's going to come that way. Because that's what the British do. They come through this, they echelon through. But uh, cunningly gone gone down and attacked it from a more northerly direction. Um, also to give it the due, the 44 Brigade attack has drawn a lot of attention and, drawn, and drawn some German reserves, which are now being trapped north of the river. Um, so, they're about half past two, they've achieved all tivs, tivs, and they're for, for 5th, 7th Gordons to come through, the follow-on battalion. But they're not going to be coming through, they're not due to launch until about half past seven. So there's a lot of chat going by coming forward. So, well, if, if, you know, if you're getting on that well, why don't you just crack on? Well, let's 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 stop the fire plan so that we can do that. The headquarters are north of the north of the bridge because there's some jam of the bridge that won't let their jeeps across. They eventually get around that. It'll get sorted out, and then uh, D Company of um, Fire Black Watch then push ahead, break through. Then they capture Matasek and all that stuff. That good stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Fifth Seven Gordons come through. By this time, it's half past seven. They've been attacked. The Germans have been attacked on that axis now. They've essentially stalled what's happening in the north, or think they've stalled what's happening in the north, but they're being attacked down the same axis. Through no fault of their own, there's no way to get a, a different axis going there. But, but there's been a long gap. Stealth's been lost. The axis is apparent, and they've brought armour with them. Uh, quite, a lot of, quite a lot of armour with them. That's making clank, clank noises and draws fire. The armour is of almost no use, certainly to begin with, because it's so rubbled and because we don't have decent armoured infantry cooperation in towns doctrine at that time. Um, and their fire plan's been cancelled. So that for the fifth Black Watch to do their exploitation, the fire plan got cancelled and they're in the same problem of, do we switch it back on again? Do we know where our blokes are? How can we get onto that objective? All those tricky questions that normally get put down as British lethargy is because they've got a complex command system, firepower heavy. It's very difficult to sort out. Um, and daylight. They've also got to deal with multiple firing points. 
people shooting down side streets. If you're going to cross that side street and it's finding where the enemy are, as well as getting across those little open spaces and the bigger open spaces. They also meet uh, Mendel's uh, parachute reserve, which is starting to, 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 to resolve the situation. Um, now, here's the bit where you, uh, it's worth saying about, you know, the slog of, uh, of urban combat. It is a slog, but there's not many casualties. Um, there's quite high officer casualties because they're having to go from between one platoon who's in a cellar here and another platoon who's in a cellar there. And we've got a section that's in somebody's garden. We've got to clamber over that rubble. They've got to run about to try and get everybody coordinated. So the officer casualties are quite high. But the casualties amongst the men are, are, are really quite low. Once they've got them, they're in a house. It's, you know, it's, it's really quite sturdy. They're, they're, they should be OK. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is worth skipping through. Yeah, so there should be a big yellow, big yellow line on there, but it's not. Keep, just keep going. Skip through the next one as well. Um, and that's the point where the postcard was taken from. So next slide. I'm hoping you've got that. Ah, there we go. So that's the slide that we started with. So this is the view from the German side. Think about urban as it, it gives you an extra dimension. So uh, so uh, there's a lot of people about third dimension. But if you're attacking in a rural setting, you're in one hedge line. They're in the other hedge line. You've got to cross this open ground. All the other fire is going to be on that one line. It's going to be on one dimension. Now, there's all, there's all those multiple firing points. They've all got top cover. They're, so they're resistant to artillery. They can be firing from back from the windows. You don't know where it's coming from. It's very difficult to do. And they can shoot down on you. When you're on that open ground, though that ground doesn't look open, being open, being hammered, that car park, the town square, um, you can be shot down on where you can't be when people are firing at you from a hedge bottom. So you could, those lovely little bits of micro terrain, that bit of a bit of a dip that you get into, that's no use if people are shooting from you, on you from above. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there, with my lines worked. I know how to do my lines now. Uh, I've worked it out what the problem is. Um, so there's the British front line. Uh, you'll see the church that was in the uh, postcard viewpoint, and you see the, the, the postcard viewpoint written down there as well. Uh, you see North off to the left, and that's the town square in the middle. And they, the Fifth Seven Gordons, they have to fight their way to the town square through small pockets of Germans that have been reactivated. The fire plan's gone. They've worked out that, you know, they can now just slow it, slow the Brits down a bit. Um, and they're meeting all these extra powers. They were shooting from all different directions. So getting through, they have, to, they have to fight through to get to their start line. They get to their start line, and they find a great big pile of rubble with lots of firing points that they fit, fit, very, very, very difficult to get through. And the organisational problem, so as I mentioned earlier, that's the really big issue of, of getting from point A to point B. So if you were still, if you're back in the rural thing, you're in your hedge bottom and they're in their hedge bottom, company commander says, come on, lads, up we get. Everybody in here in distance stands up. The people at the side see that, they stand up, everybody gets up and goes. But if you've got to go to, you know, eight different rooms and say we're going to go in two minutes the fire plan lifts at such and such by the time you've got to the end room knackered knackered and b everything's changed so it's really difficult to get that cohort from that, that that friction is is extra double um next slide please um so we go back to 44 brigade in the north now um and what happens is uh, so the, the numbers on the side represent the numbers on the map i should have said that earlier sorry about that um Tanks rock up first thing in the morning. So the two number ones. Um, a, a, a troop of tanks arrives where the tanks are, are in the eight rules area. Uh, they, they, hook, they hook up. Somebody walks them down the train line so that they can get there so that they don't strip tracks. Um, they hook up with the infantry and they start brassing up German positions. And what they do is they go through sequentially. They, they, there's, one defense, there's one strong point. They fire at it a few times. These guys now, they're in circle. They've heard the fighting going on down south. They, they really can't escape. They can't do much against a tank when it's got close infantry support. So they throw the towel in. But they do it in little clumps, 10 here, 20 there, 30 there. Eventually, they get 230 guys surrender. I think they kill four of the defenders that morning and catch 230, and they lose five of their own blokes, four wounded and one killed. You know, a, a, an exceptionally good result because of that combined arms thing, but also because they've encircled, encircled the enemy and they can't get out and they can't do anything about it. Um, 
Then uh, a very similar thing happens to the KOSB, but less so, less dramatic results because they're, they're not encircled quite so many things. Um, then uh, eight Royal Scots Reserve Battalion, oh, sorry, eight Royal Scots Reserve Battalion, Battalion pushed through. And that's very slow. I believe they do it dismounted. They get uh, a lot of harassing and, and uh, indirect fire. They take about 30 casualties just to indirect fire as they're moving up to go through to clear. And it's really difficult. They've got the same, they've got the same problem clearing through town. One or two snipers, a couple of machine guns, a bit of mortar fire, and the whole assault will break down. And that's, that's the problem with the urban thing. So the Germans are harassing and withdrawing the river, the river from in the north. Um, also about this time, four Royal Welsh Fusiliers, part of 53rd Welsh Division, launch another extremely successful attack. Most of their casualties appear to be in, uh, they capture about 104, 64, 65, something like that. Uh, Germans themselves, just the one battalion on their own assault. Um, and most of their casualties uh, come on German late indirect fire that's fallen on their position after they've achieved it. Um, and they follow, I think they follow a proper barrage, and that's part of the reason for their success in the north. Um, so, meanwhile, they've got this defence counter in the south, and that's trying to slow the advance or stop the advance in the south. The neck of that, the neck of that bag open so they can withdraw as many people as they can from the north into the south. That's why everything was so much harder in the south than it was in the north. Next slide, please. Um, so, another, oh dear. The other lines disappeared. Okay, so I've known what the problem is. There's a line drawing tool in Word that doesn't seem to have made a line on your. Um, it works on mine, but it's not on this. So you see the dotted line there. The dotted line is their fallback position. Um, if you go over to the left hand side of the dotted line, there is all that area north of there up to, up to and including the river line that you can just see. They're all. Um, it's a large pocket of Germans there that they need to withdraw. If Gok falls, so Gok now is, is kind of um, is kind of a, a British salient almost. If Gok falls, then then the British will dash down that road to to Vesel, uh, to, to Vetzer, and on through the south and and down and and we'll get to the bridges, uh, or we'll get to the Americans, one or the other. Um, so that's why there's this redoubled effort in defending at this time. OK, next slide, please. Now, 153 Brigade down in the south. Ignore the two big yellow arrows couldn't take off. Take off. Um, uh, so what we've got in the uh, on the 19th, one Gordon's come through. So seven, five, seven Gordon's already. Sorry for the confusion that there's so many Gordon's kicking about. And they still don't move all day. They've got real trouble. They've, you know... The, the, the guys are just knackered as far as I can tell. Um, but one Gordon's come through, and they come through Five Black Watch, and they do to a shallow flanking move to one side of Five Seven Gordon's, and they have a little bit of success, but not too much. They've got some crocodiles with them, so flamethrowing tanks, got some Churchills with, Churchills with them. Um, I think at this point, this one of the Churchills gets knocked out by Panzerfaust, and that cuts down the armoured support in town quite considerably. Uh, later on, they do a wider flank where the number two is, and they capture a... Um, uh, a small uh, housing state on the edge of town there. So they try and do a wider flanking bit. So, uh, and they don't come through till 11. So, so what we've got is one company launching at one in the morning, one battalion launching at one in the morning, another battalion going at 7.30 in the morning, and the next battalion coming through in dribs and drabs from 11 because of the difficulty getting troops. To the Otherwise, they would have done this a lot faster. So on the 20th, now the north is finally cleared. They've definitely cleared everything in the north, maybe a few little pockets and some stragglers hiding around in some way in cellars. But pretty much the north side is cleared. So that's the number three we're doing. Uh, four sevens gone, fifth sevens gone, still stalled. Up in the north there where the number five is, um, um, one of the Seaforth battalions and uh, one of the Cameronians battalions, they're out clearing bunkers. They've got crocodiles with them that are helping them clear bunkers. Uh, we could talk about bunkers for an hour, but let's not. Um, now, this is a mistake by me. I put this on the 21st. I realised this and corrected it. But what happens late on the 20th, one go later on on the 20th, on the 20th, not that late, um, go for Thomashoff, which is the uh, number six you can see down, which is like a, which is like a, a arm, arm with quite a big, quite a big complex of buildings. And that's strongly, they, they capture that German counterattack, 
Rover runs the company that's there. Uh, they lose 30-odd guys um, go missing, so essentially they're captured, uh, driven on the, off the position. Um, then the, one Gordon's launched her own counterattack, desperate fight, desperate fight, retake. And that's where the entities analysis ends. And it, it says, at that point, there's some mopping up. Uh, but the town is, is, is essentially captured late on the 20th. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the night of the 20th to the 21st. Sorry for that, a slide typo at the top there. Uh, five Black Watch launch a hook. They've had all day of on the bus, off the bus orders. They were going to go in daylight. Uh, they were going to launch from Thomas Hobbs. This big, this big hooking move that you can see, the big yellow arrow at the bottom. Uh, but don't have shells, shells. And it's going to be murder if you don't if you do it without without smoke. You're just going to get shot to pieces. So we'll wait until later. They're, for a while there, they think they have to go in and rescue uh, Wong Gordon's and Tomasov itself. Um, but they don't in the end. And they launch their start line is Tomasov. And they'd go on the night of the 20th, uh, the night of the 20th to 21st. Um, their phase one objectives are two farms about between the where the numbers two and number three are. That's their phase one objective. So there's these two intermediate farms. Each one's a company objective. I think they attack two up, uh, but they may do a snake. It's not really said in any of the accounts. Uh, so they achieve those objectives with a, good, with a good, strong fire plan. They're able to get onto that objective virtually unmolested, but then they have hard fighting in the buildings. Um, stabbing folks, bashing them over the head, all that kind of stuff. Uh, very intense, close quarter fighting. Um, they're counterattacked on three sides. They counterattack from the north, the south, and the east. Uh, they fire the second phase fire plan to drive that off, and they eventually drive off the German counterattacks. Little local hasty attacks, you know, company level stuff, platoon level stuff, uh, and they get driven off. Um, there's a, a, a genuine element of confusion. Some people overshoot, and then uh, the, the follow on company they get drawn into a bit of that fire, but then. That's when they'd re, they'd rejig this assault, and it goes in about about in about in about midnight time, um, and they attack another farm complex, Slavinian, uh, Slavanian, I think. Um, if it's written down, I might be able to pronounce it, but I can't see. And they go for that, um, uh, <laughs> and they go for that. Uh, but what that is is another big farm complex which has also got a lot of pits dug around it that look to me, from the uh, defence overlay, they look to be like it was originally planned as a gun position. An awful, an awful lot around there, around there. Very difficult to fight through. One of the buildings is on fire, so they're all lit up. So again, getting through the gaps between buildings, even in a farm complex, is very difficult when you're lit. So there's a bit of a nasty fight. Um, but also, uh, they hear armour moving in the distance. And this is the first definite confirmed piece of art, German armour operated in Gok itself or in the Gok environs itself. Um, uh, now, after that, then D Company of the 5th Black Watch, who've now been lying out in the open, getting a bit cold, getting a bit shivery, everybody's on their chin. Uh, their company commander, Major Brody, goes, come on, lads, let's go, let's peg it. They're in a big snake. They get strung out. As they, they dash. They dash on to this next objective, this lone farm, the number four. Um, they're briefly pinned down by machine gun fire from the farm. Get down. Get reorganised. Then get up and in bayonets, revolver, nasty stuff. Clear those houses. The rest of the company joins them, as do uh, I think uh, two uh, Archer Valentine anti tank guns. You attract anti tank guns, and they get onto that position. Now, they're counterattacked from all over the place. Meanwhile, meanwhile, that clank, clank they've been hearing in the background um, is, is a, a, a composite force. It's got, it's got five uh, arm, heavy armoured vehicles in it. Uh, Panzer IV, various E's, so, so tank destroyers or assault guns, turret list items, um, and up to, I would say, about a dozen either armoured cars or uh, half tracks are involved in this counter. A lot of infantry, mix of para, mix of 15 Panzer Grenadier, a mixture of the, whatever we can get together to put them in for this counter attack. The idea being to keep that bag open for everything over, over in the West so that they can withdraw. 
Uh, they go in, they smack into what must be third or fourth attempt by fifth, seventh Gordons to launch an attack and overmatch them. They also smack into uh, the seventh Black Watch, who have a bit less, less but that, that stifles their attack as well. But it, all, that essentially collapses most of the German counter and they try and break out. Two of the SPs can take that, take that hook down where the number seven is. Um, and they withdraw into the back of Black Watch where the number four is. So they get into the back there. Fifth Black Watch think, oh, it's, it's, it's some armour. It's coming from behind us. It must be ours. It gets quite close. And then there's an exchange of fire. One of them gets knocked out by a Piet. I think, I think in this instance, it bounces off. But the crew jump out anyway and, and surrender. Uh, if, they're, if they're allowed. Um, and the other one bugs out. But they're now cut off the rest of the battalion. As far as the battalion knows, one runner gets through and he says, there's SPs that have surrounded uh, D Company and they're pouring rounds into them for 50 yards range. Uh, they're attacked from all sides, um, Panzerfaust, machine guns, little elements. and The whole battalion is, is subject to lots and lots of these little piecemeal counterattacks. Um the impression in, in, in the British accounts is that this is all, you know, um, German enthusiasm. You know, they're really keen Nazis who are, you know, fight to the death kind of thing. But reading between the lines, it's, it's like a lot of them are lost and they don't know where they're going and they bump into the Brits as they're trying to escape. And that seems to turn into a counterattack. However, uh, they hold out. The D Company 5th Black Watch hold out until daylight. The whole of Black Watch hangs out until daylight. Sun comes up. Hey, presto. Uh, the, plane, the plane ahead of them is, is covered in groups of Germans wandering about. Um, and then there's the quote. For the next two hours, the gunners had the time of their lives. Shells were crashing down on the enemy in the open. Victor targets began, so a Victor target is all the core guns. All the core guns at this time could be about 500 guns all firing onto one eight-figure grid reference. Um, I, I, might be doing, I might be doing my own version of war porn then, but there's an awful lot of fire going into a small place and multiple ones of these call, call up, fall on these Germans as they're trying to form up to launch counterattacks and, and, or trying to escape. And these get absolutely mullered. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the enemy were in a state of victor fire targets began and the enemy were in a state of chaos. The uh, forward observation officer could hardly contain it. So it's, it's, so it's, it's a gunner's dream. There's all these there's all these fuzzy wuzzies out there, uh, and they're out in the open. I can see where they, I can see where they are, and I've registered these areas. And we're just going to start laying it, it on, and that's what they do. The entire defence collapses because because the exit is now threatened. They can't do you know now both roads, both surviving roads out of got are now over overlooked, and the entire defence collapses. Um, fifth Black Watch. As all these guys, you know, melt away, try to launch, relaunch counterattacks, there's a very difficult, confusing day. Fifth Black Watch are all calling out, now we need to explore. We've got them, we've got them on the run. Um, the exploitation doesn't come for three days, three days. But that's another story. Um, and all that back end of the story, the two big arrows and everything there, that's all left out of the uh, 80s video, and uh, the 90s video and the 80s uh, operational research. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so I've got a couple of conclusions here, uh, Richard, <laughs> and I've got cramp in my car. Oh, right. So conclusions, conclusions back in the 80s was and, and, and no, no fault for people who did it before because it was, you know, a quick piece of work done, done, done well. Um, the 44 Brigade did an armoured infantry attack. They did combined arms. They were quick. It was cool. They attacked on multiple axes. They had tight control and they had low casualties and they did it in one day. But now it looks more like the armoured infantry was slower. It was about one-fifth the speed of the dismounted attack. And that's not even counting all that time it took to arrange and organise and get everybody together in the assembly area and get the attack launched. It wasn't really combined arms. It was, it was very clumsy coordination. Tanks got, tanks got together in the end and they did some good stuff. But almost, almost by accident, certainly not as a result of tight control. There seemed to be very little control. And they used no more axes, rather than using multiple axes, they used no more axes than, um, than uh, 153 Brigade did. Because once they were able to exploit, they repeatedly tried to outflank. Um, 
And it didn't take one day, it took two days. And the low casualties were all because of what 153 Brigade did in the South to cut them off. It's the cutting off that matters. It's the open ground that matters in urban combat. So 153 Brigade, rather than being slow and dismounted, were actually quite quick because they were stealthy. They had some advantage because of, because of you know the Germans had been distracted. Um, and there was, uh, again, they had clumsy cooperation. Um, <laughs> hold on my family are coming back now <laughs> i'm just going to tell the kids to not make much noise so they did flanking twice uh, they were a little control and it took three days not two but it took three days with good reason wait one second well uh, while he's just gone i hope you're enjoying this folks sorry about the occasional audio skips but yeah brilliant stuff stuff <laughs> So my kids healthily, healthily come back from their tea um, um, and uh, are wondering on the dog will start whining in a minute. OK, so the conclusion is fight like 153 Brigade, all that ish, and accept that the problem is not urban attrition, it's urban motivation, getting people together to do that thing and urban coordination. Um, and this suburban killing areas is where all the casualties are taken. At least, at least three quarters of the casualties in the battle for Goch were outside Goch. They were in the open areas between the built-up area. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so the conclusion number two. So the, the ones I've highlighted in white are, are ones that are kind of new, and the ones that are grey ones are ones that have already been spotted before. So don't bomb-ish. Um, the, the bombing has this, this morale effect, but it's only temporary. Its lethal effect is very much reduced in urban areas. And doing that without hitting people is really quite difficult. If there's people there, you don't want to hit. The rubble just slows manoeuvre. And it's, it, this is even quoted in the, uh, the Battlefield Tour and the director's edition of it, that the infantrymen would ask the airmen to go elsewhere. And that comes from 153 Brigade, I think. Mm -hmm. um, do do co co close cooperation, but do it three ways or four ways. Infantry, armour, artillery, pull them all together. Um, Use decentralized teams. The Americans were pretty good at this. They did these little decentralized teams to, to clear arc. Some, somehow, Britain didn't get it together except when it cuffed it by accident at the end. Um, speed, stealth, and surprise, which were written in to the 1943 British urban doctrine, um, are still really important. Uh, isolate the town, that's all written in doctrine, but infiltrate and flank. The flanking does the thing. Beware those open areas. Then add in things. Then we get things like things like civilians and cyber and things, and electronic warfare, things that people didn't really bother about in those days back in the day. But the main thing is that you don't have to destroy the city to save the city. This is a this is a catchphrase that goes around when people talk about urban combat. What happened in Hawaii? What happened in Manila? What happened in Stalingrad? We had to do that in order to win. We had to kill loads of people, and maybe you don't have to. Uh, next slide, please. Right, that's me done. And all that slide says is, you know, we can learn lessons from the past in order to avoid disasters in the in the future. Um, and right, sorry for the admin there. <laughs> Hope everything's okay. Right, right. Um, well, I'm just going to mute you while I'm talking. Um, firstly, it was brilliant. Um, audio um, glitches aside, really good stuff. It seems to me, I haven't I haven't seen the. I will go and watch the eighties, nineties videos. Is that there was a certain amount of kind of when they were assessing this after the event, some of it was confirmation bias. They were looking for things they thought were there that weren't there and some things they're ignoring. So um, what, 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 how did the British Army improve? Did they do any improvements to this immediately? Because, you know, the war carried on. Is there anything they learnt immediately they implemented? Uh, yes. Um, uh, subsequent urban actions, we got on the phone, rang ahead and said, uh, we're going to come. Why don't you... Why don't you, dear mayor of, of, of whatever town it is in the middle of Germany, tell the local defenders to surrender or leave? And quite often they did. Um, the Canadians in, I think it's Groningen, um, a, a near bloodless attack, didn't blow the heck out of it. Close coordination between armour and infantry to, to get a good result at little cost. Um, and the other point is the, the general kind of this idea that Operation Veritable is kind of going against what the Allies have been quite good at for months, which is lots and lots of planning 
and then and then some more planning and then a bit more planning again and and the fact that, that right at the beginning you said you know the nine plan nine different plans in seven days for one of those units there it's this is not what the allies have been getting good at i mean the the, the german battle of the bulge offensive was hastily planned by them and the Allies responded it to very well. And now the Allies are hastily putting things together. And it seems that it's going against what we should be doing. Uh, yeah, I can only half hear that question because now the kids are back. The dog is whining. <laughs> OK, well, I, I think we'll, we'll probably just bring it to an end. Quit while we're ahead, basically, Dermot. But um, yeah. um, it's been really good. Um, the, people, are, David O'Keefe is paying you a compliment. And David, we know, analyzes things very well. He's our DF and Enigma man. But... Um, are you going to expand on your Verita? I mean, this you, you've concentrated on Gok, but are you looking at the wider battle of Verita? Oh, yeah, no. They're, they're, so this is one of nine chapters. Um, so there, there's there's artillery chapters. There's a morale chapter at the end, which is which is going to be funny if I ever get to it. Um, and, and lots of stuff about manoeuvre. Uh, I'm currently... So why I had to write a crib sheet is because I'm currently in the next battle. I'm, I'm now with 53 Division trying to break through uh, uh, Vesta to the south, which I probably mispronounced. Okay, well, um, and, and lovely stuff. Well, brilliant. We'll have you back on again. So we'll, we'll quit while we're here. I'll just remind people what we're coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye in a, in a, in a second. So, folks, um, nothing tomorrow. My day off tomorrow. Sunday, it's an afternoon show. So it's 12 p.m. So lunchtime UK, 1 p.m. for me in UK. And that's when we're talking about our first show about Japanese units, Japanese naval landing with Austin over there in Tokyo. So that'll be quite exciting. Then Monday, it all kicks off again with more stuff. So um, as usual, don't forget to subscribe. If, you, if you're new to the channel, click subscribe and click the button, so, the bell, so you get notifications. Consider becoming a member of the channel on YouTube. Just where you see, you go to the World War II TV page, page and it says join. Join means you just bang a couple of quid my way each month and it helps uh, me fund what we're doing here. So that'd be great. For, if you want to get in contact with Dermot, get in touch with me or get in touch with him, we can do that. But right now, I'm going to say thank you very much for that presentation. And we managed to get through it despite all the, um, the hiccups. And I will talk to you again because I was mesmerized by that. So really good stuff. So um, did you enjoy it despite the fact you're not in your man shed? I, 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 I'd love talking uh, and getting red faced when technology bites me. It's, 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 it's my bag. It's, it's, technology is, is here to serve us, but it ends up we serve it, I think, half the time. But anyway, it's been brilliant talking to you. So this is Paul with World War II TV saying I will see you all again next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.